What's going on, everybody? This is Smiley's Garden. We're back for the uh, organics takeover here on Eagle Gardens channel. And uh, this this month's guest is uh, the soil doctor, Bryant Mason. And uh, really excited to have Bryant along. Um, I guess I could let you introduce yourself here too, but and I know you're a, a certified agronomist. And um, oh shit, sorry, man, I hit a button here. I was bringing up chat. I don't know why, but uh, Brian's a certified agronomist and um, specializes in organic nutri nutrition, right, for plants. Right. So yeah, I can tell you a little bit more. So I, I um, as a, yeah, there's a there's a society of agronomy where you can become a certified crop advisor. You have to learn IPM conservation practices, nu nutrient management, and I've gotten that, but then I specialize directly and intensely on organic nutrient management. So I, I work with organic growers on pre-plant amendments and mid-season fertility, foliar applications. I'm all about nutrient flow between soil and plant. And that's sort of what I specialize in. That's awesome, man. And that's what I'm really excited about. I do, I do want to shout out too, because I, um, I know you were just on a couple other of the podcasts, the Future Cannabis Project, and uh, and you did a great one with Tad Hussey uh, as well. Tad a, does an awesome podcast too. So um, I took some notes from those, and I kind of wanted to spin off into a little bit of a different kind of area with you, if you didn't mind. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, there's There's been kind of the topic, uh, a lot of people have been talking about calcium and calcium uptake, but then you kind of touched on some of the micronutrients and one of them really caught my attention, which was manganese. And, and uh, it's just one that we don't hear a ton about. I know um, a lot of people listen to uh, AEA, John Kemp, and, and he talks about the manganese too, but um, you were mentioning that a lot of, a lot of the pre-made soils are pretty low in that. Um, yeah. That's a great, that's a great place to start. Manganese is interesting. Manganese is critically important for photosynthesis. Um, it's sort of the, it's, it's involved in hydrolysis of water from my understanding. Um, and it's really anecdotally, it's really important in flower and in, in sort of flower sizing and, and yield. So what's interesting is, yeah, I, I, in most soilless medias, um, I'm recommending manganese sulfate and manganese sulfate should only be applied at a few grams per cubic yard, but most soils on a standard soil test, so like a strong acid malic three test will show only, you know, 10 to maybe, or probably more like five to 25 parts per million compared to iron, which is oftentimes well above 150 parts per million. And that's the solubility of that manganese on the saturate paste report is also really low. So um, what else can I say about it? I, I am a huge fan of seeing growers push manganese a bit harder. There's sort of a myth, I think, that says that you should run iron one-to-one uh, -one with manganese. And the reason I call it a myth is I, I it, well, first off, it depends on how you measure that. If you're measuring that in the soil solution, if you're a hydro grower, if you're looking at a standard soil test, they're all going to show something different. Um, but I do think that you should, iron should always be a little bit higher than manganese. Um, but to your point and to, to your question, it, it's usually um, running way below iron. So I think that most growers, I would say 90% of the growers um, I work with need higher manganese. And if I can actually add one thing to that, um, there's a few, this isn't new. This isn't, this isn't new in the cannabis industry because I'm seeing more and more like trace mineral products that have all the trace minerals in one packet. And, and several of those have pretty high manganese. So there are times when people are using those, those like micronutrient packets that the manganese is pretty elevated. So that would be the exception. And, and usually that's elevated with a manganese sulfate still, right? I mean, that, like you were talking there. Um, yeah, you know, there's, there's really no way to get the, unless, unless you happen to be in a part of the country that has high manganese naturally in the soil, if that happens, then the plants in that area will, will have high manganese. And so then all the compost in that area 
made out of the plants will have high manganese and then the compost that goes in your soil will lead to good you know sufficient manganese levels but unless that is the case you really do need manganese sulfate to get manganese i don't know of another organic source um, to target that specifically okay. now um kind of tying into that you had made a comment in one of the other podcasts about how the hydration of the soil it plays a more important role as far as plant health you think as as far as that goes than like total nutrition so um when i was listening to some of the stuff on manganese that john kemp was talking about he was mentioning the correct oxidation state that it had to be in the to be able to be absorbed by the plant and i know when we talk about hydration of the soil that's kind of that changing of that oxidation state right yeah that's a that's actually that's an exceptional question too um so let's see when it comes to let me just back up i'm just i'm going to talk out loud because i need to review the the redox reactions so iron definitely iron 100 percent needs to be in the right redox state it needs to be in the reduced form and iron sulfate or anything, the vast majority of iron is in the oxidized form. Manganese is similar, um, but less, um, less fragile in its redox state, but it still needs to be in the reduced form. So straight manganese sulfate, I actually am not sure if it's in the reduced or the oxidized form. Unfortunately, um, I couldn't tell you whether watering well, I could, if, if you have like a waterlogged soil, let's just take it to one end of the extreme where you have a, a totally anaerobic soil that's completely underwater, it's gonna be in the reduced form. Um, and in a totally oxygenated soil, it will tend to be in the, in the oxidized form. Um, soil is more complicated. It's not like totally wet or totally dry. There's pore, there's different um, pore space where there's essentially micro environments that where there's some pockets of moisture and some pockets of, um, of gas or oxygen. So you're going to get both in the soil. I think where the majority of the redox reactions happen is actually in the rhizosphere. Uh, at least that's the case with iron. I'm not sure with manganese where the, the roots have the ability to, um, to essentially bump into a nutrient. So it, it, the, the root slams into a nutrient oftentimes and shoots out protons or um, carbonic acid and can actually acidify the, the immediate area like less than one millimeter uh, fr from that root. And pH, it can create a pH change um, and create redox reactions that, that these trace minerals into the available form. So I tend to not overthink redox state. I tend to just think that if you can get the nutrients in the soil in the right quantities and the right balance, then the sort of magic of the rhizosphere should, should be able to make them available. Um, you know, and, and, and let me also add that biology also has the potential to um, change the redox state of various minerals. So that's kind of how I think about it, but you're absolutely right. Water plays a part in that. Um, I, I think, I think of water more because nutrients, this is, this is sort of a misunderstood thing about nutrients. They actually find their way to the root in three different ways. One is called mass flow. One is called diffusion and one is called interceptive root growth. So, um, water is critically important in both mass flow and diffusion. So when it comes to nitrogen and potassium, phosphorus, they actually have to travel through water um, to the root. On the other hand, something like copper or iron actually has to hit, you know, hit the root physically in order to be uptaken. It doesn't flow diffused through water. So when it comes to moisture, that's why you see nutrient deficiency symptoms when you have like you know, drought like conditions in your soil. So that's, I know that's sort of long winded, but um, it's a complex question, a good question. And I, 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 there's a lot to say about it. Yeah, no, I understand. And, and that's kind of the role, like what biology is trying to do in a, in a 
general broad sense, right? When we talk about, oh, you know, the, the biology is eating up these rocks that are in the soil, it's basically doing that. It's, re, it's changing the oxidation state, right? Like that's yeah. kind of how it's dissolving it and eating it up. Absolutely. I mean, they release enzymes and they release acids and they, um, yeah, that's how they, that's how they dissolve minerals or mineralize things to, to create um, plant available forms. The other beauty of it is that when they, when they spit out or poop out or, or eat and then die, the, the minerals that they release are in, in highly chelated form. So they're attached to or, organic, um, organic acids and organic chelates that the plants just love. So yeah, the, the, the role of biology is nutrient cycling. And without biology, you just can't get nutrition right. So in one way, in, in one sense, biology really does drive the entire system. Um, I don't focus on it because it's so complex that it's hard to manage, in my opinion. But there's no doubt that that is the role of biology. And without that, you'd have just, you'd have no nutrients. No, and that makes sense. The um... Now, I guess just to kind of caveat this, because I raised the topic, now everybody's going to want to dump manganese in their soil. Is there an excess of manganese that would be needed to be mindful of? Absolutely. There's an excess, you can have an excess of, of pretty much anything. Some things are much harder. I'm thinking calcium and sulfur are much harder than, you know, let's say boron or copper, but all those, all those micronutrients, um, you can have an excess and it's pretty easy. So the reason when I recommend micronutrients to, to beginner growers, it makes me a bit nervous because I'm recommending a couple of grams per cubic yard of soil volume, which is like nothing, you know, like, or I'm sorry, a couple of teaspoons. So I might recommend four teaspoons of manganese sulfate per cubic yard of soil. Well, how do you distribute four, four teaspoons of a powder in a in 27 cubic feet of soil? And the only way to do it is to dissolve it in water because all anything that ends in sulfate is soluble. Okay more or less. It has a degree of solubility. Well, the trace mineral sulfates have quite a bit of solubility. So you can dissolve all of them in water and then spray them either on the surface of your soil and till it. Or uh, when you're mixing your soil originally, you just, you know, as you're, as you're blending it, you just spray it to get really thorough distribution. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you really should stick to just a few teaspoons. My whole approach is you work up very slowly. I never, I'm never into trying to, to correct things dramatically in one fell swoop. I think of cannabis cultivation and really any cultivation as a, as a lifelong journey. And so why not walk, not run? And that rule absolutely applies to the micronutrients. Okay. So, and you touched on too about um, rock dust. So like the rock dust is a really common thing. And me personally, when I mix my soil, I kind of did the whole double up on the rock dust thing. Mm -hmm. And the thought was, is that, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to have all this stuff slowly releasing and covering, but you made the comment that that isn't enough to cover the need of the plant. Um, is, so we would still want to add some kind of a magnesium sulf or manganese sulfate on top of that. Right. Yeah, that's, that's another misconception. And by the way, let me just add one more thing for, for listeners who are interested in this stuff. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to excess manganese, just go back to your last question. Have you, have you looked at the Mulder's chart before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a great, that's a great visual representation of, of what actually happens when you apply too much of something. So Google Mulder's chart and like manganese will start tying up iron and copper. So you'll oftentimes see deficiencies of other things when you have an excess of something. So um, that was just the thought I should add it. But when it comes to um, of rock dusts, and I'm going to put kelp meal in the same category. These products are wonderful in that they bring in a full spectrum of non-essential but beneficial nutrients. So things like Oh man, selenium and silicon and um, vanadium and all of these things that that act as biostimulants, both for the plant and for 
microbiology. And what's interesting about them is if you think about the best, most fertile places in the world, they're, they're river valleys that get flooded and get new sedimentation. Um, they're glacial valleys where glaciers come through and deposit their minerals. And most, my favorite is, is volcanic areas where volcanoes distribute um, essentially volcanic dust in the form of these really broad spectrum trace minerals. So the best, the best Pinot Noir wine, for example, comes from the Willamette Valley in Oregon, which is, a, and, and it's attributed to the volcanic soils that give the wine like a rich, robust taste. So there's something to say about the relationship between full spectrum trace mineral products like a glacial rock dust or a basalt rock dust or azomite or, um, or something like that and quality. There's, there's absolutely something there. And I really love this idea of terroir or terroir. It's, it's a wine term that I think totally applies to weed too. It's, it's um, something we haven't really like figured out scientifically, but it exists. So I'm not against rock dust, but when it comes to essential nutrients for, for photosynthesis, like manganese and, and iron and boron, those products don't, um, don't contribute any significant quantity of essential micronutrients. It's true, they're truly products for, for broad spectrum, uh, like the, the intangible terroir. And I think they're biostimulants and they may Im improve plant health, but at the end of the day, the plants need manganese and they're not going to get it from rock dust. Gotcha. Cause that's kind of like some of the idea kicked around though on, on some of these like kelp and, and other plants like alfalfa meal say, or soybean is that, you know, the plants have already taken up all the essential nutrients to grow themselves so putting a meal down of that should cover that spectrum of those essential nutrients, but that's not necessarily the case on a lot of that. That's a good question. I mean, the, I would, there's, a, there's a little bit of that. When it comes to organic amendments, part of the beauty of using these amendments is that you use soybean meal, you're not just getting 7% nitrogen, you're getting everything. Um, what you're really getting is a footprint or a reflection of the soil in which those soybeans were grown in. Probably in Iowa or somewhere in the Midwest, those soybeans were cultivated. And so they're going to reflect the, the nutrient profile of that soil in which they were cultivated. So yeah, you'll get a few PPM of manganese and a few PPM of X, Y, and Z. Um, but there's a couple important things to note. The, one, the first is that ca cannabis is an incredibly heavy feeder. So um, you don't, you don't need to apply manganese sulfate or solubor or zinc sulfate to get a good yield because there's, there's, you know, there's trace amounts already in the soil, but to really push yield and to push quality and to push you know, flower sizing and plant health and disease resistance, you really do need more of the, the micronutrients than uh, a soybean crop in Iowa would need. The second thing is that soybean crop may be grown in a pretty degraded soil. So that soybean crop may be, it's probably experiencing hidden hunger of those micronutrients because it's a commodity crop and, and the majority of the, of the fertility is um, synthetic nitrogen, maybe a little bit of synthetic phosphorus and maybe some potassium, but they're, they're not usually applying the manganese. So those soils maybe 200 years ago May have had really wonderful and, and um, sufficient levels of manganese and high organic matter, which is going to contribute and chelate manganese. But over a hundred years of intensive cropping, that soybean meal probably doesn't have much in it. Another long-winded answer. I'm I'm sorry. No, man, that's great because it's it's filling in the blanks. You know what I'm saying? Like some of that stuff is we like we as in, you know inexperienced growers, we can grab one piece of information and go run with it right like everybody's gonna put 50 pounds of uh gypsum on their on their <laughs> 10 gallon pots right so yeah. i i mean it's just one of those things of keeping it in balance and and um there's one other interesting real topic and it kind of plays along with something you'd mentioned along with micronutrients is the rate of photosynthesis and i think that's kind of a 
for me, that's been kind of a topic of contention a little bit, because I think even in the aspect of like cannabis growers, we like to put real high powered lights up. Right. And we like to think that every one of those photons is hitting the leaf is is going into sugar and getting getting through the photosynthesis process. But the more I listen to you guys on the agronomy side, even like John Kemp, he talks a lot about rate of photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. And if you can increase that rate of photosynthesis. And um, I guess I'm just wondering what might be helpful in that mindset of trying to do that indoors. You know what I'm saying? Totally. Love that question. So photosynthesis, if you really break it down, um, is light. <laughs> What, so there's there's essentially ingredients to photosynthesis. There's light, there's water, um, there's CO2, and there's nutrients. And so there's always there's always a bottleneck in, in photosynthesis. Very few plants are operating at 100% of what John Kemp would say is their photosynthetic capacity. He, he has a lot of numbers that I don't know where he gets, um, but it doesn't really matter because his general point is really awesome. And it's that, and, and so what he says is that, that growers are only harvesting about 10 to 20% of the genetic capacity of their plants. And that's because at every step in, in, in every second of every day of that plant's life cycle, there's something limiting that photosynthetic capacity. It could be temperature, it could be moisture, could be CO2, could be light, could be nutrients. So in an indoor environment, um, it goes without saying that, that um, you know, optimizing your vapor pressure deficit, in other words, your temperature, humidity uh, relationship, as well as your lighting. And lighting is way beyond me. Um, I, I'm not even interested in learning about it. It's, it's just a whole other world. But if you optimize your lights, you optimize your, your, um, your temperature, humidity, and uh, obviously CO2 levels too, because CO2, that's why you get higher yield with CO2 supplementation is because it's pushing photosynthesis. You control those, you're left with two things, and that's moisture and nu nutrition. So um, optimizing moisture is a whole other conversation, but more or less everyone's trying to do that even if they're, you know, failing or succeeding there, everyone knows the plants need water and then it, it leaves uh, nutrients. And that's the most complicated one because there are so many, there's 16. So um, essentially the same rule applies to nutrients, which is at any one time, some one, there, there is one or several nutrients that's limiting the photosynthetic capacity of the plants. And so how, how I think about it is my role as a consultant is to, is to try to figure out what nutrient at any given time is limiting photosynthesis. And it's really that simple. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess I don't know what else to say on that topic, except, you know, I could, I could dive into kind of the tools to use to try to figure that out. But, but if, you, if the best visual to sort of represent this photosynthesis conversation is um, there's a barrel with slats in it. It's called, and it, and it represents uh, Liebig's law of the minimum. So have you seen that barrel where it shows these different slats that represent different nutrients and different elements of photosynthesis? And the, the, the lowest slat is where the water is gonna spill out of the barrel. So at any one time, there's one thing that's, that's the minimum if you will, that's limiting photosynthesis. And the goal, I think, of any grower is to try to always be trying to figure out what that one thing is. Okay. Now, when when the plants are limited in photosynthesis, like you just kind of covered the environment is set, right? Our VPD, our lighting, all that's kind of set steady. But if we have one of these nutrients that's limiting photosynthesis, what what happens to the light or into the plant then? How does the plant deal with those photons that are? That's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm having to think back to my physiology class. Um, what would happen? So obviously what would happen to excess photons absorbed? I'm not really sure. I think they would just be, they would just, um, 
sort of move the, the, the chloroplast, but not necessarily create, there's a number of reactions that happen. Um, and so when, when a photon hits a, uh, a chloroplast, it releases electrons through a, a cascade. It's a, called an electron chain. And as these electrons uh, jump into a higher energy state, um, they do things. It's like a factory. If you, if you look in, in plant physiology in a cell, it, 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 at least it's taught like a factory, which is kind of cool. And so that these electrons jumping into a high energy state are like the fuel uh, of a series of um, reactions. And you're kind of catching me at a time where I'm not able to re really explain photosynthesis in detail. I don't oh, think about funny. that often. Um, it's pretty complex one. I, I guess I was thinking you were going to go talk about photorespiration. And uh, um, I know they do release some of the photons and heat energy too. But basically, in my mind's eye, like if I'm oversaturating with them with light, I see a negative response in the plant because whenever photosynthesis is limited, it's actually going negative. And I don't know if that was happening. That's kind of what I was wondering. Yeah, well, there's definitely a relationship. I guess maybe we were getting at is like there's definitely a relationship between nutrient levels and light intensity. And if if and it's not only light intensity, it's temperature. And if the leaf temperature, I believe, is about is goes over about 86 degrees, it goes into photorespiration mode, which is um, yeah, it's negative. It's like the it's a it's it's the the opposite of of photosynthesis is essentially respiration. And so. Um, which happens 24 seven. It happens all the time. Respiration does, but you don't want your plants to go into, and you can actually see this because the transpiration stream stops and you'll start to see um, nutrient buildup in the, in the lower leaves. If you're doing like a, a, a gradient um, sap analysis. So yeah, I mean the, you can definitely, the cannabis plant can deal with higher nutrient levels at higher light intensity and maybe um, that's because of what we're talking about. Maybe it's, it's actually the reverse that, that light intensity necessitates higher nutrient levels for the exact reason that you're talking about to, to keep photosynthesis high. Um, you know, photorespiration, again, I don't really think about lighting much because I, I cut my teeth in, in outdoor, uh, production. So, so you kind of take what you get, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, but, but photorespiration to me is also, more a function of temperature, especially in out, outdoor production. Like when it gets really, really hot outside, that's when plants shut down and photosynthesis starts to decline. Um, so anyway. They start eating themselves basically, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're just not able to make use of that transpiration stream and those nutrients. So um, this is a good question I know, and I've asked a few people about it, but uh, we all want to have the most healthy vibrant plant we can but there really isn't a is there really a good way to gauge plant health um and and how or how do you go about that or obviously we're not going to get sap analysis and stuff like that but i mean just mm -hmm. is there visual cues are there different measures that yeah this is a great question and most i mean my immediate response when it comes to plant health is like that is the that is t truly the role of the grower and the role of observation. And um, most crops have very, very specific traits that they exhibit um, that, that sort of indicate health. And I've, you know, when it comes to cannabis, it's like cultivars are so different that they all sort of express themselves differently. And so I, my, the easy answer is that you just really have to get to know your cultivars well and just understand them through multiple crop cycles in multiple sort of nutrient uh, scenarios to sort of see how they exhibit it their, at their peak health. What I look for is um, short internode state spacing. So I like tight internodes. I don't like leggy sort of long reachy plants. Um, I like dark green leaves and veg. Uh, I don't 
like to, I don't like to run plants kind of at that, at that borderline hunger level. I don't, I don't believe in that. I like to, I like to enrich them. So I like dark green leaves. I like fully expanded leaves. Um, I like fairly defined uh, leaf margins, but I don't like super jagged leaf margins. Like, you know, I don't like any bending or curling up on that leaf margin. Um, I don't love purple uh, or I'm sorry, red streaking on, on stems or petioles. I think that tends to indicate um, that not, I, I don't want to call it a deficiency because I think that tends to lead to an overreaction, but I think that means you can push um, total nutrition a little harder and it, it could mean that it, it's, it's needing a little bit of potassium or phosphorus or nitrogen. It's always a little bit different. Um, I like rigid cells and I like rigid leaves, uh, turgid leaves. Um, I like thick stems. So if you, if you cut your, your main stem down at the end of the season, and I've, don't get me wrong, I've done this a million times to have that really hollow stem. I like that to be as filled in as possible. Um, I think that's often a function of, of early calcium uptake and veg. Um, Let's see what else, you know, the whole praying thing. I don't know. I don't know how much information that usually tells me. I think it's a good thing. You want your plants to pray. You definitely don't want them sagging or drooping or canoeing. Um, when the leaf margins start to taco, usually I think like my, that there's always an issue or a plant stretch issue when you get drooping or tacoing of the leaves. Um, what else? I mean, what else am I forgetting? There's gotta be more. You know, the big one that I was thinking was like a bricks measurement. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So you're talking more from an analytical standpoint. I don't like bricks, and here's why. Bricks, br bricks is, a, is a measure of, of total dissolved solids, essentially, in, in, a, in a liquid. And the majority of that is usually sucrose. But it doesn't matter. The, the, what I don't like about it is that if you took – plant juice and you, you, you concentrated it, it would show a higher brick. So when a plant is super, um, droughty, it's, it needs water. It's, it's limp. It's not turgid. And you take a bricks reading and I've done this before. You can get a really high bricks reading. Hmm. The other thing I don't like about bricks is it jumps all over the place. So, um, you know, between morning and night, different times of day, different size of the plant, I have found, and I, I only mess with bricks one year, one season of my life. I was taking bricks readings all the time and I couldn't get a consistent bricks reading. It was crazy. So it could be that I'm missing something. Um, the, the, and let me add one more, more thing. It doesn't actually show you what the plant needs. And that's what I don't like about it. I guess from a general plant health standpoint, I guess it could work, but at the end of the day, uh, it, it kind of leaves something to be desired when you're wondering what exactly you can do to, to get that plant to a healthier state. So for all the work and intensity and, and sort of the, the number of data points you need, that it, it doesn't necessarily lead to a good, clear uh, signal. That's my, that's my problem with it. Gotcha. That said, if I could add one thing on bricks. Yeah. I think most growers use it to diagnose a plant response to a foliar application. So you really can take your brick reading, apply a foliar, take another bricks reading. And if the foliar was effective, you should see a, a, an increase in bricks. This is what I've been told. I haven't done this personally, but, but multiple agronomists use it in that way. That makes sense. And that's kind of what I was going to lead into with the next question is like, so I know that photosynthesis is um, producing the sugar and John Kempfoss often talks about like in the plant health pyramid, he'll talk about a plant converting to complete um, nitrogen synthesis. So he's, you know, it's taking all those sugars and making it into a, an amino acid and then making those into proteins from there. But if we're measuring bricks, that was my other thought on that. What, are those amino acids still measuring in that, that bricks reading or 
Because, I mean, ideally, we would want low bricks then, right? We would want all that sugar getting tied up into amino acids quickly. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it definitely doesn't differentiate between the complexity of the molecule. So, Kemp, you know, in his in that theory of the, the, the pyramid, which I don't love the py of his pyramid, but it's, it's, again, it's a good teaching tool, and I think there's something to it. The, there's, you know, the idea is that these compounds that the plant is synthesizing are getting generally more complex and longer and harder to digest from, you know, by insects. And yeah, bricks reading would absolutely not differentiate between a long complex lipid and a simple carbohydrate. All it's looking at is solid, dissolved solids in solution, which is primarily sucrose. So yeah, you would, I mean, you might see a lower bricks reading from that. I think, um, yeah, what else can I say? A bit bricks, it's just, it, it also depends on where you're squeezing, you know, what part of the plant you're squeezing. I've, I've literally on the same plant, on the same cannabis plant outside at the same time of day on the same side of the plant, I took a bunch of leaves and I have this, I have this specialized vice grip that has these two metal plates stacked on top of each other. So I put the plant material in this vice grip I crank it down, I squeeze it, and I get like a perfect three drops of plant material. I put it on my refractometer, I look through it, I get, I don't know, a fuzzy eight or something. And then wipe it off, put some distilled water on it, dry it, same plant, different leaves, vice grip, squeeze it, three drops, refractometer, and it's a different reading. And I'm like, <laughs> so anyway, I don't know. I Maybe I'm missing something. I'm, I'm open to be schooled on this topic, but I don't like bricks. No, and I, I agree with that. And I've used it before and kind of found similar, similar instances. And, and to be honest, anytime that I've really kind of taken one and had it be like a low reading, it wasn't a surprise, you know, or if I took it and it had a high reading, it, it was a visual cue there already that the plant was happy, you know, it, was kind, of, it kind of always fit with what I was already thinking anyway about the plant. If it wasn't happy. Once you understand your genetics, you know your, if your plants are happy or not. That's yeah. my opinion. I mean, it, it may take a couple seasons to really kind of walk. It's, it's all about observation of your genetics and just kind of see how they express themselves. Um, but I've also, I mean, like I said, I've taken really un, unhappy, unhealthy plants and seen high bricks. And I think that, um, yeah, so. Um, <clears throat> so. Now, when we talk about like balancing a soil on like a saturated paste test, I and mean, we're talking about that relationship with the cation exchange, um, I know like calcium is a real predominant one, takes up a majority of the CEC sites. And uh, the what I'm kind of wondering here is if I started the season with a, with a totally balanced soil, everything hit them bullseyes, right? And I run that plant, what what kind of ranges would I expect to see or what things would really need to be re-amended for another round? Um, just in general, I know they're going to be different between cultivars and different things, but just kind of. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not as different between cultivars as you'd think. The cult, cultivars express themselves very differently and they tend to have different preferences, if you will, but they're, especially with, you know, magnesium and phosphorus and nitrogen. But when it comes to the actual total uptake after harvest, it's more similar than you would think. Um, what depends more is your soil volume. So if you're, if you're growing in a 15 gallon pot or a 30 gallon pot, it's going to, it's going to be different. Or if you're in a four by eight bed, or if you're in the ground, it's going to be wildly different. Um, and how long those plants are in veg before they're flipped into flower. So if they're in, if they're transplanted into 15 gallon pots and they're in there for six weeks before they're flipped into flower and they flower for eight weeks or whatever, that, that soil is going to have nothing in it at the end of the round. Um, so anyway, to get back to your point or to get back to your question more related to like what, I guess is the question like what becomes imbalanced first through a, a crop cycle, like what needs to be replenished fastest? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm wondering. Yeah, so um, potassium, nitrogen, and calcium. 
um, are uptaken in the highest quantities. Those are all around, you know, like 5% of the total plant mass is, um, you know, ideally 5% calcium, 4% nitrogen, three to 5% potassium, depending on your growth style. Um, so that's a lot. That's a lot. While something like, um, I'd have to pull up in my. Like magnesium or. Yeah, magnesium is only like half a percent, right? So the issue I see. It's kind of funny because that's the one that everybody seems to focus on with like Epsom salts and different things. And, and totally. just, yeah. I mean, it blows my mind. Calcium's 5% and magnesium's a half a percent. It's like. Yeah, like totally. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty funny. I mean, the optimal mag target established by university research, you know, replacement rate is 0. 0.4 to 0.8%. So it's pretty low. And, and I've noticed that different cultivars do have a pretty wide range of magnesium requirements, but I am really not a fan of, of putting more magnesium in the soil for two reasons reasons. One is so easy to give it an Epsom salt foliar. And the plant response is usually very clear, which is nice. It's nice to have a bit of feedback. So it's an inexpensive, simple foliar with a, with a quick 24 hour plant response and the ability to toggle between cultivars without changing the underlying soil chemistry. Because once you have too much magnesium in your soil, it's not mobile. So it's, and it's, and it's not you know, so it's not, it's not going to be able to go leach out through the water and it's not going to be uptaken in super high quantities by the plant. So it's sort of in there for a while. And the majority of worm castings and compost I see bring in too much magnesium to begin with. So only I'd say less than 10% of the, the cannabis soils I look at, am I recommending a magnesium product such as K-Mag? Sure. Almost so, never recommending Epsom salt, to be honest. When I see low magnesium, I also see low potassium. Um, and so I'm, I'm recommending Lingbanite. The trade name's, you know, Sulpomag or K-Mag. So when I see that there, occasionally I see high calcium, high potassium, and really low magnesium. And to me, that's the sweet spot. That's where you want to be. Um, because if you need more magnesium, because one, when the magnesium is super low, you're going to maximize the calcium and potassium uptake, which is really important. And two, if, like I said, if you need more magnesium, you, you hit it with a foliar. So, um, yeah, I see high magnesium way, way more often than I see deficiency. Gotcha. Here's another interesting thing about magnesium while I'm on the topic. Cool. I haven't figured this out. I have no idea why this happens, but I, I oftentimes see magnesium deficiencies in plants when there's a, when there's a, a, a excess of magnesium in the soil. And I cannot figure out why it is like really high magnesium levels where I'm like, oh, that's a problem. And the plant shows a magnesium deficiency. It's very strange. And it, it made me second guess the soil test for a while and my targets for a while. And I've seen it so many times where um, I actually just think that, that the plant, um, isn't able to uptake calcium in sufficient quantities when there's excess magnesium and it, and it, it sort of like creates a metabolic physiological issue that, that um, is essentially an internal magnesium deficiency. That doesn't make any sense. I realize, but it's, I see it all. The no, time. but that's like being thirsty and drinking salt water, right? Like you're just, yeah, there you go. They'd be making the plant want more and more of it. That's interesting too. That, uh, yeah. And that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. Um, I'll let you know when I figure that out, if I <laughs> ever do. Yeah. And the other one I was wondering too, so like, you mentioned the molders chart and we talk about like mobile and immobile nutrients and um, how true, I mean, does that really stay super true? Like if, uh, you know, magnesium, since we're on that topic, for example, a magnesium deficiency would show up in the, in the lower leaves because it's a mobile nutrient in the plant. Right. And as, yeah doesn't always though, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of what I'm wondering if it's always like that, you know? Yeah, no, it's not. I'd, I'd say, I'd say, I'd think of it more like this. 
nitrogen. Well, not even nitrogen. Some I, I've seen nitrogen deficiency show up. Um, I mean, usually it's obvious, right? Your bottom fan leaves start dropping. Um, they, they tell you when it's, when it's, you know, when you're kind of riding the bottom line, I don't tend to care. I think, I think, you know, when the plant starts shedding bottom leaves, it is what it is. Um, but, but that's, that's a mobile nutrient and that's clear. Nitrogen tends to happen. It tends to show up deficiency in the bottom leaves. Calcium and boron are always at the top of the plant. Like, a, like an acute, an acute deficiency will, will always show up toward the top of the plant. Now that said, I see calcium deficiency on fan leaves mid plant too. Um, iron deficiency tends to be at the top of the plant, but again, I've seen, you know, it, it, actually, let me, let me just say it's not top and bottom. It's new and old growth. And that actually gets a little bit complicated because one lateral, lateral, branch will have new growth on it. Right? right. So I think maybe there's a little bit of nuance there that it's, I should stop saying top and bottom and start saying new and old, but no, I think to your point, most of them are moderately mobile or moderately immobile and they don't necessarily follow the rules that we want them to. Gotcha. Um, I do got a question too about calcium with, uh, in, in previous conversations, I mean, gypsum's often talked about with calcium. You, you mentioned wollistonite, um, the calcium silicate. Um, where would like bone meal or crab meal or fish bone meal fall in to that calcium spectrum as far as trying to add it to the soil to become plant available? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so all of the, so, so besides gypsum which i love gypsum i i recommend gypsum in 90 percent of my soil racks um well last tonight not as often because the usually the ph isn't an issue i only rec recommend last night with a, to get a ph hike same with ag lime same with oyster shell flour so those are the primary sources of calcium organically um if you're targeting calcium, but to your point, you've got crustacean meal, like crab and crustacean meal. And I recommend, um, I'm looking at my chart here. Crustacean meal is, uh, I think it's like, it's got a lot of calcium in it and it's 23%. It's quite a bit. So it also brings in quite a bit of nitrogen. So I, I, um, recommend crustacean meal, when calcium's needed, when nitrogen's needed, and when the pH is not too high. Because I've noticed that large quantities of crustacean meal, I'm talking like five to 10 cups per cubic yard, or obviously more, will, will push the pH up a little bit. So the calcium in crustacean meal is obviously bringing, is bringing in some carbonates, um, just shells, you know? Yeah. So, so crustacean meal is a great source of calcium, but it'll push the pH up a little bit. Bone meal, and fishbone meal, I see it for some reason, and I've done so many calibration tests. I've, even though they're 20% calcium or whatever, 19%, they, it's it's a slow release. It's a really slow release. And um, again, I think that it's it's not a pH neutral source, um, and those should really be dictated more by phosphorus deficient phosphorus um, need, if you will, more than calcium. But I, I'm a huge fan of bone meal, fish bone meal, and crustacean meal as sources of phosphorus and nitrogen because along the way, they're going to give you more calcium. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was looking for is um, just like calcium alternatives that may not adjust the soil pH. Like I know. I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I'm trying to find, that's why I use so much gypsum. Is it's like, what's the source of calcium that doesn't push your pH up and doesn't bring in huge amounts of other nutrients? Like, I, I don't know. I mean, in, in yeah, in non-organic production, you've got calcium chloride, um, calcium nitrate, I actually don't really know the others, but those are the two that come to mind, but I'm not a huge fan of, I, I just don't do anything non-organic. So I don't really know. Um, 
I just think in, in nature, most calcium comes with carbonates. Um, so it's hard to disconnect the carbonate pH increasing sort of conjugate with the calcium ion. And that's why gypsum is such a special beast. Now, uh, there's the, I think the magic of gypsum is that it dissociates it into calcium ions and sulfate ions. Calcium is not super mobile in a real topsoil. Soilless media is different. Like it needs something to latch onto. And because there's no clay colloid to, for those calcium ions to, to grab onto, they're, they're pretty mobile too. But in theory, in, in, in like conventional soil science, the calcium ions aren't going to leach. They're going to latch onto the clay. They're going to push out everything else before they leach. But those sulfate anions are super mobile. So with precipitation or irrigation, you can put the gypsum in the soil, the calcium stays, the sulfur goes. And that's pretty cool. And so, um, but in soilless media, it's not as much like that. When you put in gypsum, your sulfates are going to, your soluble sulfur, sulfur is going to be at hundred parts per million pretty quick. Now, luckily cannabis doesn't seem to care. And in fact, it, it thrives at high sulfur levels, but um, in a perfect world, I'd want to run my sulfur down near like 40, not a hundred, but keep my calcium super high. And so if you find that source of calcium, let me know. Well, it just kind of brings up, um, you guys said you had talked about acetates and I know like KNF farming is, is a real, you know, the WCAP or whatever is a real popular one. It's just vinegar and shells basically, but in an acetate form, when, when we water that in, I'm, in my brain, I'm just picturing that being like a, a huge disturbance to that, that whole balance of, of what's on the cation exchange sites already, right? Because calcium is pretty heavy and it would, wouldn't it push some of the other ones off sites? And yeah, it's an interesting question. I guess I don't know enough about some of these like Korean um, I mean, I've heard of that, like eggshells and vinegar, but I guess I've, I don't know enough about them and I haven't thought enough about it to really like think about what, how that would change the chemistry. Maybe I need to play around with it and do some calibration testing. Cause I've always been a little nervous at trying to use it or apply it just under that thought that it's just so readily available that I'm, you know what I mean? It's going to tie up or do something else in the soil if I pour it in. If I apply I mean, it foliarly, I've heard it doesn't move around in the plant the way it needs to either. So that's kind of the conundrum of it, I guess. Oh, huh, interesting. Yeah, I can't, I don't know. I mean, to just speculate the, well, first off, we have to remember that in soilless media, are you growing in soilless media or topsoil outside? Uh, I'm in pots, but it's uh, it's my own mix of soilless media, I guess. But Yeah, so... There's no, like technically these cations and cation balance in general, just that term is talking about clay, right? Because the clay is like a dinner plate and it has all these charges around the outside and you know, yep. you, it, yeah, you know how it works. So in a soilless media, it's like, we, there's nothing for it to cling to. So I don't think it would necessarily displace anything. It would simply increase your ec and soluble salts and maybe your whatever if you have a bunch if it's a acidic product it can change your ph it can it can do funky things but it doesn't ultimately push anything else out because the only the only ex exchange capacity is just held in your 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 organic matter which is really just your compost you know um because or, or tied up in that organic material like this crab shell before it gets broken down. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's com it's complexed in organic material, whether that's an organic amendment or compost. But if it's complexed in there, essentially it's like in the middle of it and it hasn't been digested or broken down, it's not accessible. So when we add soluble products to our soil, it doesn't really change the cation balance. The soil test will show that it does, but that's just because it's, it's not, it's not like, um, the soil tests aren't actually showing what's truly happening, right? You can have a total CEC number on a soilless media. That doesn't mean it's actually CEC. What that means is that the, the lab is extracting all the cations, adding them up and then displaying a CEC number. 
um, which is different than what a real topso would have, which is like an exchange complex with all the cations latched on. So the acetates, I'll get back to you on the, I mean, what I would think about the acetates is like in theory that that vinegar would neutralize those carbonates and you might end up with uh, a, a calcium source that's not gonna, yeah, I would just have to test it. I would just have to put it in solution and shoot it off and see what's chemically in it, you know? Yeah, most definitely. Um, earlier we had talked, we, you mentioned about an hour. We're coming up on that. I do got more questions, but it's up to you. I don't want to. No, let's keep, let's keep rolling for a little while. I'm going to cut it off at a certain point in time because um, I try to go, I try to like wind down. If I don't stop working, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't fall asleep. It just, it just keeps cranking. Like I'm going to be thinking about manganese and I'm acetates <laughs> and like photosynthesis. And I'm going to be like, Anyway, so no, I know it's a lame reason to stop, but this guy's no, got it's not stuff. a lame reason at all, man. <laughs> that is a great reason. But um, along that same line, though, so you mentioned uh, like I did make a, a soilless media, right? I did the basic third, third, third Cornell mix, um, but I I did add in a ton of the rock dust, and in my mind's eye, the finely ground rock dust. I was picturing myself as adding in a clay particle to that. Um, on the test result, I did have just a, a local test done, but it, it did show a really high cation exchange. And it also showed a really low organic matter. Um, I had like 10% organic matter. However, my aeration, I used pea gravel and sand. So it's a really, really heavy mix. And, uh, and I think that that the organic matter percentage is a weight percentage. So that heavier media probably pushed that down. But I'm really wondering if that's what I did was add it. I mean, would you look at a finely ground rock dust as being a clay particle in the soil? Mm, no, I wouldn't. I would see it more as a, a fine sand and sand just doesn't have any CEC. Like I look at topsoils that are sandy loams or like, you know, um yeah just sandy loam and sometimes their cec is like three which wow. is nothing so and that and that that three is coming from organic matter and from a few clay particles that are there so no i wouldn't see it i just i just truly think that that high cec number is how the lab is computing the the cec i think they're just summing the cations in your soil, which there's probably a lot in the compost and in, you know, gypsum, maybe, maybe just, and, and they're summing it up and, and they're saying, oh, this is the CEC because this is the summation of the cations. And I, so I, I, I ex my guess is that, um, yeah, just don't, and, and I, yeah, I think, I, I just don't think CEC is the right metric for soilless media. Don't overthink it. Gotcha. Organic matter is, is usually done through what's called loss on ignition. So they heat up a soil sample of a certain uh, mass to, uh, I should know this, like something crazy, like 2000 degrees. And it pretty much just any, anything that's carbon um, ignites, it burns. And it, and, you know, when fire, when anything, it, um, ignites it, it releases CO2. So they measure the amount of CO2 that's lost up at 2000 degrees, let's say, and they essentially divide that mass of CO2 divided by the mass of the soil. And that's your percent organic matter. So why it's 10%, if you've got peat moss and compost, I don't know. Again, I think that's just kind of like a lab specific thing. Okay. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Which is again, why soilless media, like the organic matter reading is worthless because you're just, you're just igniting peat moss. That's not true organic matter. Like true organic matter previously called, you know, um, like hum humic substances, like it, they're, it's not peat moss. Peat moss is inert. There's no nutrients in it. It doesn't have a CEC. It doesn't do any of the, thing, the things that true humus does in the soil. So um, don't worry about both of those readings. Gotcha. Cause like, I think it's azomite is considered, isn't that like a bentonite clay? 
And that's kind of why I was thinking along that line of the uh, the rock dust being that clay fraction, just because I know some of them are actually referred to as a, a clay. But well, like yeah, like calcium bentonite is different because that's like a that's a clay, and that'll provide you trace minerals. I guess it depends on your rock dust. I mean, sure, there could be a clay. I don't think azomite's a, a bentonite. You, I could be wrong. Okay. Um, because it's yeah, all I mean, broken down rock, right? It's just the particle size that's actually defining whether it's clay or not. I mean, exactly. But I think that the thing, so, so even a piece of sand has a charge. Um, but the, the particle, when the particle size becomes that of clay, which is less than two microns, I believe, um, it has so much more charge. Like it really has to be and clay particles are tiny and it's, it's a surface, it's a function of surface area. So I, you know, it's a good question. It's like, oh, yeah. is, is the charge of a particle completely dependent on surface area? I think so. And I just think that, and clay is, I mean, think about silt, silt is tiny, tiny. So, and yet it doesn't have a huge CEC. It, it truly requires a tiny little particle of clay to have, um, significant charge so unless your rock dust is like clay then i don't think i don't think it'll add much okay because that brings up the other thought is the whole idea of paramagnetism and, and uh, yeah, good. too and a lot of people think of that as oh you know that's gonna be able to hold and exchange nutrients and, and it's like the more i've dug into it it's a little different than that so i don't know if that's uh yeah. Para paramagnetism is a whole different thing it has nothing Nothing to do with nutrition it has it's it's about biophysics and energy flow it's about magnetism and where i've come with para, paramagnetism is like there there are so many facets of agriculture that are considered niche water structuring <laughs> paramagnetism um and and i don't want to disregard any of them because i hope i live long enough where science is going to uncover miraculous things that we previously thought to be bullshit that end up being very powerful phenomenon we just didn't see before. We just didn't, we just had, you know, the blinders on. Paramagnetism and magnetism in general is a field that I think is not well understood and it probably has significant influence on plant growth. But my opinion is that A, we don't know enough about it to actually make management decisions on it and to spend money on it. like it's just not a good use of funds to spend money on something that is completely unknown and unproven but the other thing that i think is more important is i think of all that type of stuff as like the final one percent if we're going to talk go back to photosynthetic you know capacity or the genetic potential of a plant there are there is such lower hanging fruit when it comes to watering and nutrient management and environmental control and that that like chasing structured water and paramagnetism just waste of time like you're you're going you're trying to grab that one percent and you're missing the other 90. that makes sense to trying to yeah dive down cover the bases that you know are basically there and then then go after some of the other stuff if you want kind of sure um when we talk about organic nitrogen sources um, a lot of times, like we mentioned soybean meal or alfalfa meal earlier, those are looked at in the, and if you looked at the MPK, they'd have a high nitrogen on there. But when we mention, um, do plants actually uptake forms of organic nitrogen, I guess is what my question is. They do. The debate is in what, in what quantity. And um, there's no way to measure it because well, that I know of, I'm sure there's laboratory techniques in universities, but the, cause, cause what happens is you put in organic amendments. So the nitrogen is in the organic form and then it's very quickly mineralized by bacteria and the bacteria and other organisms, um, break it down and release it into ammonium. So it's no longer in the organic form, it's in the inorganic form. And then the ammonium is very quickly converted to nitrate, inorganic. And so my belief is the 
actually, I, it's not, I, I know this, the majority of nitrogen uptaken by plants is in the inorganic form, forms, I should say, of ammonium and nitrate. Then as soon as it's in the plant, the plant converts it into organic forms again. It's, it sends it into amino acids and um, proteins. So, but, but it, is, it is pretty well known that plants can uptake organic forms of nitrogen. It's just, a, they're competing with those microbes for, for it. Um, and they're not, it's not very soluble because it's complex. And so it's, it's hard to know when you put in a liquid, like a soluble soybean meal, like an amino acid, yeah. how much of that is being uptaken as amino acids and how much of it is being super quickly transformed into ammonium and nitrate and being taken up as that? I don't know. And that's, yeah. And that's kind of what I was getting at was the whole amino acid portion of that is, is like, that's a sugar and a nitrogen. And when you said, uh, you know, the biology is converting that into ammonia and nitrate. And I, I, I know that's a lot of the reading, but I also read where, where those microbes are using that, those minerals, because they need nitrogen, calcium and all that to build their bodies. So they're basically tying that up because, um, Basically, where this is coming from was another discussion in the ag world where a guy was talking about raising his, his the levels of organic carbon in his soil. And at the same time, it would actually raise the levels of organic nitrogen along with it. So those two were kind of tied two and two together. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the only reason he was saying that I'm trying to look for a slide. I'm not going to worry about it. I'll end up deep trying to find something. Um there's so organic carbon in soil is completely correlated to organic nitrogen because soil maintains a fairly consistent uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. So those two things, if you're organic, if your total carbon goes up in your soil measured by organic matter or just soil organic carbon measurements, your total nitrogen is going to move almost perfectly correlated with your total carbon. There's a, a measure in statistics called R squared, which measures the correlation between two variables. And the R squared is like 0.98. So it's like extremely correlated. Um, but I, I, I'm sorry, I feel like I lost the question. What was it? No, I'm just kind of curious about, I mean, like I'm as a organic farmer and a lot of the guys that are listening do it, we do it indoors, we do it in pots, we're top dressing some stuff. And, and it's like, I hear these discussions where like too much nitrogen applied can actually be a negative to the, the biology. And, and a lot of those, um, the topics now are, are along the lines of amino acids. And I'm just trying to get in my head where, where some of those may play a role in trying to apply that to the soil. Um, foliarly um yeah i got it beneficial kind of thing i mean i that's a great question i think i think in general you get greater plant health you get lower disease pressure you get better internode spacing and you get better flower quality when you don't run nitrogen too high you get better terpene profile. Like I've, I've grown like really kind of chlorophyll-y weed, just, just overfed, you know, just kind of like screws, screws up flavor and aroma. I think, um, so, so that's obvious. And I think every, every, people kind of know that. I think that the form question, like how much do amino acids matter? I, I tend to think that what matters more than anything else when it comes to nitrogen management is making sure you have the right quantity of nitrogen available to your plants at all times throughout the entire cycle, not too high, not too low. And, and if that's in a nitrate form or the amino acid form, I don't think, I, I don't think it matters too much because it, it probably, it may matter, but I just, I would choose perfect precision of timing and quantity over amino acids any day. Okay. Um, I think foliar applied amino acids make a lot of sense because uh, amino acids have higher uptake efficiency than something like nitrate or ammonium. Um, I think feeding with 
amino acids make sense because you're going to be feeding organic forms of nitrogen no matter what. So in a perfect world, in my opinion, you want to run all your nutrients pretty high, but nitrogen really low. And you just want to spoon feed the plant amino soluble amino acids as the plant needs it. And if, if it gets converted to nitrate and uptake in that way, it, who cares? It's like, I think what's more important is you're keeping your nitrate low and you're, you're, allowing your EC to be a little lower, your osmotic stress to be a little lower, the uptake of other nutrients to be higher, as long as you don't ever let your plant go get hungry. So in a perfect world, if you had total control over fertigation or drenching, I would, I would go with soluble amino acids uh, any day. Yeah. And that, um, well, it kind of ties into that whole carbon to nitrogen ratio too, right? So like if I'm applying in any form too much nitrogen, this, that ratio gets out of whack, it's going to deal with it in that biological form, right? Yeah. So you're saying in the carbon and nitrogen ratio of the soil, just to clarify, right? Yep. Like if so I go dump a bunch of, it don't matter if I alfalfa meal, if I overdo it with that, I can burn a plant just as well, you know what I mean? As far as yeah. trying to apply too much of a nitrate or something too. Yeah. I mean, it definitely changes if you put a bunch of nitrogen in, it definitely changes the carbon to nitrogen ratio um, of the soil, but I don't know how much that matters. Like, okay. I mean, you'd, 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 it would digest your compost faster because the microbes need to balance their diet, right? What are they going to eat? They need to eat some carbon. If you're, if you put a, bu if you, if you slam a 200 pounds of nitrogen in your, um, in your soilless media, like, yeah, they, they, they need to consume carbon in order to consume the nitrogen. I, I will say that most of those organic amendments have a pretty uh, decent carbon and nitrogen ratio. It's not like, it's not like a synthetic source that's just straight nitrogen. They still have carbon. So I think feather meal is still like eight to one or something. So, but yeah, I mean, a, a huge, a huge input of nitrogen those microbes are going to have to digest some of that compost, but I don't think that so much matters for plant health. I think what plants respond to more is excesses and deficiencies. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess the amino acid thing is kind of a moot point because it's sort of like, why not? You know, I guess pr for guys at scale, cost starts to matter, but um, I think keeping nitrogen levels low, yeah. I think that they, the plants just respond well to that. So like in top dresses, I mean, as far as us doing our own, that would matter for me personally. I've just realized that I'm going to be putting more tablespoons of, of things uh, along the lines of gypsum and, and crab versus alfalfa. Um, and that's actually kind of what I've realized in my own just experience with it too. So. Yeah. Well, top dressing is different than feeding too, but it, for like solubles, because, you know, you get, you drench the soil, it's right to the roots. Top dressing is different for me. How I think about it is I go heavier, like with, cause it just takes longer to, to, um, either with top dressing, it sits on the top of the soil and it has to mineralize and then kind of leach down into the soil profile. Yeah. So that kind of happens. More often than not, especially if there's mulch on top of the top dressings, the roots come up and, and find it, you know, within a couple of weeks. But either way, it's not instantaneous. Um, so usually mid-season outdoors, I top dress pretty heavy um, just because it's not as fast acting as a soluble soybean or something like that. Gotcha. Um, some fish. The one last question I, hear, I had here in my notes was about silica. And, uh, and I know um, it's a really hot topic right now. I'll just say, say it out loud. But on the other side, the, the, on the chemical side, there's, there's new products out that are just really the next miracle thing in silica. They offer them in dry amendment forms as well um, to top dress into an organic soil. But the ar argument from the organic side is that if I've got sand in that soil mix or I've got all these other things, um, is silica actually ever going to be something that we should really be focused on and concerned about, in your opinion? I think so. 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you looked at like what rocks are made out of, there's a huge percentage of silica. And so a lot of sand is silica. I don't think it's very available. Um, I could be wrong, but when I look at strong acid extractions, testing for silica, there's really usually not that much. And I, the only reason I think you should worry about silica as a, can, as a grower is it's probably the only non-essential but highly beneficial nutrient that is just so well documented to have really positive effects on cell wall strength, disease susceptibility, turgor, just across the board, it's really beneficial. And just, just stress resistance in general, whether that's drought stress or flood stress, it just, it, it definitely has an effect. Now, again, we're talking about the final five or 10% of yield and quality. And I think that there's way lower hanging fruit than silica. But if, if you're a serious grower and you're, and you're really trying to optimize everything, I think it's something to think about. Now, to, to the point about these products, these like, you're right, there's just a whole world now of silica products. I don't even pay attention to it. Um, I think the best move is to try to get wellacinite in your soil to start, because then you've got more than enough for probably forever. Um, but if your pH is already high, then you're stuck with either a foliar application of potassium silicate, which isn't technically organic. Um, I mean, we all, I think most growers don't really mind using it, but it's not organic. Um, and then like a silicon dioxide product. So, but then, but once you go into silicon dioxide, you're into the whole world of branded, you know, bullshit. So I don't know. I, mean, I think it's important. I don't think you need a lot. I think it's kind of like rock dust or kelp. It's like less is more. The plant doesn't need it in enough quantity to go super, super heavy. So any, I mean, any of these branded products, just, just a little bit in your soil and you don't have to worry about it again. Gotcha. And that's, that's kind of what I was wondering is if, cause I know you do so much soil testing and I was just wondering if that's something that you're, you know, that you kind of set a, a pulse on, so to speak, to be like, yeah, that's a good question. It kind of has its highs and low bracket if you, if you had one for silica. Yeah, I don't. I mean, even though I just said you should pay attention to it, I don't. So I guess that's a little bit hypocritical. Um, I just don't have good soil targets. I don't know. Like, yeah, again, I, I'm focused on, I, as, a, as a consultant, I'm focused on the 80% the most, the lowest hanging 80% of nutrient management, which is like get the right nutrients in the right quantities at the right time in the right form. That's it. And if, if growers can do that, they'll have massive yields, really high quality, low input costs, and they may not get that extra 10 or 20%. I think that's from things like silica and biostimulants and, um, you know, the special sauce, but ultimately it comes down to your genetics and it comes down to how well you get that, the right nutrients at the right time in the right quantities. And so that's mostly what I've, I'm focused on. So even though I think silica matters, I just, I just don't think it's, it matters enough for me to focus too much time on it. Gotcha. Um, Brian, I, I did hear you mention a soil class you were putting together and I'm personally really interested in taking that. So I don't know if it's finished or if it was something you were looking at coming out future, but if you could tell us a little bit. Yeah, no, it's finished. Thanks for bringing that up. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a course called uh, Become a Cannabis Soil Expert. And essentially, I go really deep into organic cannabis soil nutrition. And it's broken into five sections. The first section is a pretty deep dive into all the organic, uh, products, all the tools in the toolbox for an organic grower. So, um, all the dry mineral amendments, as well as a lot of the, the sort of raw liquid products that growers have at their disposal. Um, I talk about all, a lot of the stuff that we already talked about in this podcast in depth. So the second section is on how to build your own soil. So I talk about that, uh, the relationship between aeration and drainage, and water holding capacity. I talk about different ingredients, um, different aggregates, different percentages that I've used in the past, um, common recipes. And then I review 10 commercial soil mixes. Um, and I go through, I have soil tests and I go through and I really walk through line by line, looking at all these different commercial mixes and just kind of giving a review 
of what I'm seeing. And then the third section is on how to amend your own soil. And this is kind of where the bread and butter of the course is because I share all of my soil targets. So uh, at one point this year, I just realized that knowledge and information is meant to be shared. And so I, I'm literally just sharing everything, not only my soil targets, but I have charts that I've established through R&D testing that shows how much of each amendment to use to hit the target PPM. So if you have a deficit of 20 PPM of calcium, this is how much gypsum to apply. So um, how to amend your soil. It's a nine step process. It's fairly simple. It's what I do for people for 40 bucks a test, um, but I'm teaching people how to do it. So the fourth section is on mid, mid cycle fertility. So how to, how to feed, how to formulate foliars, how to top dress. And then the fifth section and last section is, is advanced techniques. So it's techniques I've learned from really good growers I've worked with who are getting consistently high yields. A um, little bit more kind of that last 10% type of thing, calcium to potassium management, um, trichoderma, biology, just different, different topics that don't fit into nutrient management, but are um, kind of more advanced techniques. And, and then I also cover deficiencies. So I walk through a bunch of deficiency symptoms and how to diagnose plant health problems. So yeah, I, I launched the course. It's, it's not yet available publicly, but if you're interested, sh shoot me an email um, or go on my website and just contact me that way. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you early access. It's discounted right now. I've, I've released it to people I've worked with in the past. So if you're interested, I'll definitely, after this podcast, I'll shoot it out to you. And if anyone's interested, just get in touch with me. Okay. And, and soil doctor on IG and is that a good way or you said your email? Yeah. I mean, the best way is, um, well, anyway, soil underscore doctor on Instagram. Uh, my email is Bryant at soil doctor consulting.com. Okay. Perfect. Um, shit, there was one other thing I was going to ask now. Oh, if, uh, if I wanted to have you test some of those soils or, or get consult with you, get in touch with you the same way, basically too. Yeah. So if you, that, that way, um, go to my website, which is soildoctorconsulting.com and get a full soil audit and a full soil audit is, is sort of how I start working with anybody. And, and then it may branch off into further testing of water or tissue testing or, you know, phone calls, writing different programs, but everything starts with what's called a full soil audit. And it's a complete soil test from Logan labs, which is $55. And then a $40 analysis and recommendations from me where I make a video and write a specific recipe to amend your soil. So it's a really kind of great entry level approach. It's um, so you order it on my website and then I, I'll send you the prepaid laboratory forms to use. And then uh, the, the lab will send me the data. That I analyze it and get back to you within 24 hours of receiving the results. So all that can be found on my website. Awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate your time. I know you stuck it out a little longer than you should, than we talked. Yeah, it's because of your questions. Seriously, those were excellent questions that got me thinking, kind of stumped me a little bit on the photosynthesis. I got to go, I got to go brush up, but I'd love to be on again and we can keep chatting about things. Yeah, definitely, man. I'd love to have you back. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's all these things like I, I know, I know so many of the people in our chat are, I mean, we all listen to all these podcasts, you know, future P cannabis project does awesome work. There's a ton of great guests on there, but it's like, it's like each one of them kind of gives you a little piece of the nugget, you know what I mean? And you're or the key. Yeah. And it's like, you're trying to piece all these keys together to, to unlock this lock. Totally. So it's totally. Really to have you I feel the same way. I mean, I feel the same way I've been doing that. I literally I'm on year like 12 of trying to just, devour as much content as I can to learn as quickly and as intensively as I can. And I think that's the name of the game. Ultimately, everyone has a different context and a different operation. So there's so many different pieces, you know, there's no, there's no formula, there's no one size fits all solution. And I think that's why just consuming widely is really important. Yeah, I agree with that. So, well, cool, man, I'm gonna let you jump out and then uh, I'll close out the, the show here and, um, if you uh, if you ever want um, those numbers that I gave you, the Zoom numbers, they're always the same. And I, I'll throw this out too. But um, if there's ever a night, Eagle does this every night. If there's ever a night that a guest fell through or we don't have one, we do a panel show called The Wormhole. And, and it's just previous guests like yourself can jump in and talk and uh, 
the topic kind of goes wherever. It's just if you're bored or not bored, I'm sure you're never bored. But, uh, yeah. you know, if you wanted to jump in and, and just throw in the invite out there for you. Yeah, cool. Yeah, you're right. I don't usually get bored, but I, I would be totally open to doing that again. So jump yeah. on the panel. So I'll, I'll let's just be in touch. And um, hopefully this was a useful conversation for folks. Yeah, awesome. Much respect, Brian. All right. Thanks so much. Signing off. All right, guys, that was uh, Brian Mason. I knew he was going to be awesome, man. I, I absolutely love listening to all the stuff that guy puts out. Um, great dude, man. If you if you don't follow him on, on IG, you should. He does these wonderful little five to 15-minute videos where he'll talk, tackle one specific topic, um, whether it's water, foliar, or whatever. Uh, he's got a list of them on his page. Um you know, he, it's just awesome that uh, he'd spend the time with us. So if you guys wouldn't even mind, maybe even shoot him a thank you or give a give a shout out about it, because uh, it's not just on the organic takeover. He's sharing info all over the place and uh, and helping the community a ton. So I really appreciate you guys showing up and uh, hanging out for the conversation. Um, yeah, I'm going to close this one out and. Uh, get with eagle we'll fire up the wormhole probably shortly after um till then do something nice for somebody <laughs> appreciate you guys peace out